When I first moved to Australia to study, it became blatantly obvious that I spoke differently. English had always been my first language, but if you know how Singaporeans speak, it may as well have been another language. So what did I do? It was a no-brainer, really. I learned to speak differently. I listened carefully to how Australians said words, and I copied them. It took a lot of time and a lot of effort, but ask any of my childhood friends. This is not how I used to speak. Of course, I had my justifications. I wanted to be understood and not distract people, but a bigger reason was probably that I really didn't want to stand out. I wanted to fit in. When the presence of others encourages an individual to behave, believe, or act in the same manner, that person is said to have conformed. Like usual, there isn't anything inherently wrong with that. Humans are highly social beings, and we like to belong to a group and have shared experiences. But here in psychology, we're interested in studying why people conform, or even what factors make someone more or less likely to conform. And there is one key study that we have to start with. This is Solomon Ash, a Gestalt psychologist and pioneer in social psychology, best known for his research in the 50s on how pressure from a group could influence opinions. In one experiment, 50 college students, one at a time, were placed in a group with seven to nine other people. They were shown diagrams like this and asked which line in the second card was the same length as the one in the first card. The questions were all intentionally really easy, but the twist was everyone else in the group was a confederate planted there by Ash. For the first few rounds, everyone gave the correct answers to put the participant at ease, who was usually placed last or second last to answer. As you can see, line B is clearly the same length as this one here. But then after a point, as prearranged, all the confederates would purposely give an incorrect answer. You can imagine the confusion on the participants' faces. Would they stick to the correct answer in their brain or conform? Ash found that of the 50 participants, at least three quarters of them conformed on at least one occasion. Let's just stop to appreciate that for a second. The answer to this is so clearly C, yet so powerful is the influence of the group's opinion that so many participants, and by extension us as well, would rather potentially be wrong than to not fit in. Ash concluded that conformity occurred because participants wanted to feel that they belonged in their group and that they believed other group members were better informed than they were. He and others would go on to conduct many more variations of this original experiment, all getting similar results. A meta-analysis conducted by Bond and Smith in 1996 found a handful of key factors that they said predicted conformity. Some of these included the size of the group. Conformity would increase as he added more confederates to the group, but the effect stopped from three or four onwards. They also found that conformity would be greatly affected if only one confederate gave the correct answer. Ash thought that that dissenter increased the participants' belief that the majority could be wrong. De-individuation, as discussed in my video lesson on the Stanford Prison Experiment, also increases conformity. When participants felt more removed from the group, such as knowing the experimenter had access to their individual responses, they were less likely to conform. And last but not least, it's been suggested that individualist cultures such as the West, in which independence is more highly valued, tended to result in less conformity on average. There are obviously many exceptions to the rule, but these were the general trends. Well, since humans seem to conform so readily and without question, is there any way that we can use this to control behavior? Well, that's literally what many ads already do. Take this vintage ad for the Volkswagen bug that everyone apparently already owns, or the fact that stores love to highlight and tell us they're best sellers. If a product is trending, companies know that consumers are way more likely to buy them. I'll have what they're having, right? Although I honestly don't believe that this is trending right now. Who are these people needing a nutshell phone holder so desperately in their lives right now? Maybe I'm the weird one. <laughs> See, these ads aren't just giving us information. They're telling us normative information. <laughs> that is, what the current social norms are. Social norms refer to the expectations of behavior in a society or a particular culture. It's a phrase we hear a lot, even outside of psychology. In 2006, Cialdini conducted a study to see if the way normative information was presented could affect behavior. He examined the use of injunctive normative information, that is, telling people how things ought to be in society, 
and descriptive normative information, telling people how others normally behave in society. Both were known to be ways to pressure people into behaving according to a social norm. They tested this by seeing if they could prevent theft of petrified wood from a national park by using signs with normative information. As you can see, the blocks of petrified wood are gorgeous and quite valuable, so it's understandable why people were nicking them. They used four types of signs that either had injunctive or descriptive normative information worded either in a positive or negative way. For injunctive, there was please leave the petrified wood or please don't remove the petrified wood. And for descriptive, there was most visitors have left the petrified wood preserving the natural state of the park or many visitors have removed the petrified wood changing the state of the park. And what did they find? In general, negatively worded normative information was more effective at reducing theft and especially if it was injunctive. Why do you think that happened? Cialdini pointed out that even though this was their finding, the vast majority of governmental information is often presented descriptively. For example, a news headline stating that drug abuse is rising in certain age groups. Ironically, this could have the opposite effect than intended. After all, telling me that people are doing the wrong thing is actually telling me that there are people doing it. Unfortunately, Cialdini's study in 2006 didn't compare using normative information to not providing any signs at all, so we can't conclude if descriptive normative information made things worse. But it's probably safe to say that social norms play a significant role in changing people's behavior. Obedience, conformity, and social norms are all ways that groups can influence and hold power over others, and often it's a combination that results in behavioral change. And to me, being aware of this it's probably a good thing.